Meu nome é Adriana Amaral, sou coordenadora do grupo Cult Pop, Comunicação, Cultura Pop, Comunicação e Tecnologias, aqui do programa de pós-graduação em comunicação da Unicinos. É um prazer receber todo mundo aqui para o colóquio Poderes do Som, tá? que é uma organização junto com o Geist, que é o grupo de estudos em imagens, sonoridades e tecnologias da Federal de Santa Catarina. E URGS, enfim, tem vários desdobramentos. Então, esse coloque é uma parceria entre nós, do PPG, Comunicação, mais o curso de produção fonográfica, aqui representado né, pelo Frank Jorge, e com o pessoal do Geist. <risos> e, então, quero dar as boas-vindas, espero que essas duas tardes, hoje e amanhã, sejam muito proveitosas. Né? Quero avisar que também a gente está no streaming, aí na, na nossa página, né? Uh, que o Diego vai estar tá comandando aí os meninos do Labitix. E passo a palavra, então, para o Zé Cláudio Castanheira, da Federal de Santa Catarina, que vai fazer as honras aqui. Bom, é, boa tarde. Obrigado pela presença. Uh, eu quero primeiro agradecer muito ao Unicinos, agradecer ao Frank, ao Gustavo, à Adri, pela recepção. Uh, esse colóquio ele é um desdobramento de uma conferência que a gente fez em junho na Federal de Santa Catarina, o, a Conferência Poderes do Som, e contou com a participação Marcelo, Cássio, Mário, Pedro, Dulce, enfim, uma galera de um monte de, de lugares, e isso é que é o, foi a coisa bacana do, do, do evento, é isso, é um pessoal de várias instituições, a gente está... Tá, querendo abrir essa discussão, abrir esse, esse diálogo, enfim, eu acho que está sendo muito bom. E vir para cá para o Unicinos é muito bom por isso, porque a gente agora está fazendo essa conversa com o Cult Pop e o Geist, enfim, e a gente faz ampliando essa rede que, que é bem bacana para a gente. Eu quero apresentar aqui, bom, lembrar para vocês que a gente tem, após o, 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 o Tim, que é o nosso keynote speaker, a gente vai ter uma, uma mesa com com as pesquisas de algumas pessoas dos nossos grupos de estudo, de pesquisa. E amanhã a gente também tem duas mesas, uma às duas da tarde, outra às quatro e meia. Então, todos vocês estão convidados a, a permanecerem após a palestra e virem amanhã, porque a discussão vai ser legal. E hoje, após a, a, a mesa também, a gente vai ter umas performances no, no estúdiozinho aqui atrás, então está todo mundo convidado. É, eu vou fazer uma pequena introdução, uma pequena apresentação do, do, do Timothy, e aí logo, logo em seguida eu passo a palavra para ele. O Timothy Dean Taylor ele é professor uh, do Departamento de Etnomusicologia da UCLA. Uh, ele foi professor na Colômbia também. Uh, e entre as publicações do, do, do ele também ele me, me falou, ele também é um flautista, toca música irlandesa, especialmente. E, entre as publicações do Timothy, ele tem um livro, Strange Sounds, uh, que é um, acho que foi o primeiro livro que eu li dele, assim, até me fez me interessar pelo trabalho do Timothy. E tem um que é lançado, não sei se é o último, acho que não, mas é o, é o que eu tenho mais recente, que é um, Music, Sound and Technology in America. Uh, ele atualmente está conduzindo uma pesquisa, que é uma pesquisa etnográfica em, sobre trabalhadores, sobre é, compu, tra, ele fala trabalhadores de som é, em filme e em televisão em Los Angeles. Então a, a, é um, um currículo bastante resumido do, do Timothy e agora ele vai vai fazer a apresentação da, da fala dele. Para vocês entenderem, eu tô eu tô projetando aqui a fala do Timothy traduzida para português, em, no caso de alguém não 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 ter a facilidade, e a, e a, a, a aquele slide lá é o slide do, do próprio Timothy, ok? Então, muito obrigado a todo mundo, e eu chamo agora o Timothy. Thank you, José. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I've wanted to visit Brazil for years, so I'm really delighted to be here. I've already made a lot of new friends, and people have been very helpful, like Jose and uh, 
Pedro and Cassiu and Marcelo and uh, Camila and uh, Adriana and who am I forgetting? Mario uh, and there's probably more. I apologize. Um, I'm going to, like we do in ethnomusicology, I'm going to read a paper, and I know uh, how difficult it can be to hear a paper in a language that's not your own. It's difficult for me, so I'll do my best to be clear and uh, not speak as fast as I normally would do by mistake when I give a paper. Um, and let me preface this by saying that this is one of a number of things I've written in the last couple of years that draw on anthropological theories of value, which I have found to be really useful. Uh, some of you may know an article that I wrote uh, that came out in 2007 about music as a commodity, um, but thanks to the anthropological literature, I've learned how to think uh, in a more nuanced fashion about not just music as a commodity, but what about when music isn't a commodity, or how do we talk about value when it's not economic value, or how do things move in and out of economic forms of value? Um, how can something like music be a medium of value, uh, whether or not we're talking about a culture that has money? So this paper is an attempt to explore how we can talk about how music moves, and not just in a physical way, in a physical form, or through you know, a, a streaming service, but how is it that music can move from Brazil to the US or the US to Brazil? Um, and uh, why does it sort of catch on sometimes and sometimes not? And that's what this paper attempts to do. Um, and it's not, uh, it's not published yet, so I'm uh, uh, happy to take your most. Uh, uh, Oh, for, okay. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to take questions and comments that can help me with the uh, revisions of this paper. Um, okay. Oop. All right, that's the title in English. That's the roadmap. Um, so here's the introduction. In the music fields and beyond, we have for some time been in need of a better way to conceptualize and theorize how cultural goods such as music, whether physical, digital, or broadcast, circulate in an era frequently characterized as global. There hasn't been a time when music hasn't traveled, locally or regionally and internationally, especially since the rise of publishing, recording technology such as the phonograph, and broadcasting technology such as radio. But the digitalization of music, and many other things, necessitates growing beyond, or at least refining, the concept of flows and various scapes, ethnoscapes, mediascapes, financescapes, technoscapes, and idioscapes, as presented in, in several writings by Arjun Apadurai, um, that have been extremely influential in the music fields. Uh, and it's been influential on me, too. I used some of these theories in my first book, Global Pop, from 1997. A Potterized formulation was useful in focusing the conversation on how people and things move in what was seen as an increasingly globalizing world. But over time, uh, over time, this formulation has proven to be something of a blunt instrument and has largely outlived its usefulness, as many have argued. The idea of flows and scapes can imply a kind of uniform movement of money, ideologies, and more. But it is quite clear, of course, that there is nothing uniform about such movements, especially, perhaps, of capital. Anat Singh, the anthropologist, argued some years ago for an understanding of just how messy and unpredictable global capitalism and its flows are. This is in her book called Friction. Cultural goods, such as music, don't circulate equally either with some musical sounds and styles finding new roots in some places and not in others. In addition, there is the problem of binarizing the global and the local, or conceptualizing of the glocal, as if goods simply flow globally and touch down locally. As Tsing reminds us, the local is made and remade all over the place all the time. Other critics have raised the problem of agency, where do we locate the agency of individual social actors in these flows? In many respects, understanding how things circulate is one of the oldest questions in social theory. 
early German theorists of diffusionism and dis dissemination, such as Friedrich Ratzel and Leo Frobenius, uh, to Franz Boas, considered such question, as did more recent theorists such as Eric Wolf. But the question of circulation has taken on new urgency with the rise of a world more connected than ever. How might we interpret the growing number of ethnographies of globalization and circulation that are becoming increasingly common? Drawing on the anthropological literature on value, I want to move beyond conceptualization of flows to argue that things, whether tangible or intangible, circulate because they have value for people. I'm less concerned here with production or maintenance of value, which I've written about elsewhere, but with the circulation of things that are thought to be valuable. And where there is circulation and value, there is exchange, not just of money, but time, work, action. Acts of exchange contribute powerfully to social reproduction on broad scales and in small aggregations, such as local music scenes. And circulation occurs in an increasingly interconnected public culture in which cosmopolitan cultural forms move. Okay, now I'm going to talk about radio. So I'll start with a case study, then I'll move to a theoretical discussion, then return to theorizing the case study. The case is radio. In today's world of an individualized, digitalized, on-demand media, radio may seem to be a quaint or humble technology, but it is still relevant to musicians. And with radio, we find fascinating history of attempts to understand the very question of how its messages circulated. When radio first began to be popular in the US in the 1920s, many people, including academics, speculated about whether radio could communicate directly to individuals, whether or not they, uh, whether or not they owned a receiver. Was radio a form of telepathy? Such concerns gave rise to the term mental radio. Researchers at reputable universities devised studies to ascertain if individuals could send thought waves through the ether as the atmosphere of radio was described. The question about the possibility of individual reception or transmission occurring in a historical moment that witnessed rapid urbanization during the 1920s and other social factors contributed to a growing sense that the US as a body of self-determining individual citizens was becoming an undifferentiated mass. There was thus a tension in this era between hopes for a new technology that seemed to have the power to reach listeners individually, while at the same time uniting them into a polity, alongside fears of the loss of separate selfhood through the creation of an undifferentiated mass. The advent of the era of mass communications raised complex new questions about the circulation of cultural goods. On the one hand, many employed discourses of democratization of access. Everyone would now be able to hear what was thought by urban elites to be the world's greatest music. But at the same time, there were fears that these unwashed masses wouldn't know what to make of this music. And so there was the rise of what in music departments, at least in the US, came to be known as music appreciation. Books and classes that taught the masses how to listen to classical music properly. Before radio, at live concerts, audience behavior could be normalized and enforced, and the music uh, could be properly apprehended, or at least if someone's, music, uh, someone's mind wandered away from the music, this did not interfere with someone else's attention. Exchange and reproduction, in the sense that I am using the terms here, are clearly taking place. People paid money for a ticket, they're taking time to listen, and according to a vast body of aesthetic writings and ideological assumption, assumptions of the social groups that attend such concerts, people are hearing music that is uplifting or ennobling, enlightening. They're also justifying their high positions in the social hierarchy through such enactments of distinction. But if one is listening at home to the phonograph or the radio, how can it be known that the music is being properly heard? How does exchange happen with ma mass mediated cultural goods? Does it happen at all? Or is there a different form of exchange? Can one still be uplifted, ennobled, enlightened, social position maintained? Can one's social distinction be maintained and justified, normalized? It is in this context that intellectuals such as Walter Benjamin 
worried about the loss of the aura of the artwork. Radio, as Susan J. Douglas observes, was probably the most important electronic invention of the last century. By the time of television, uh, after World War II, most Americans were accustomed to mass media. Theories of telepathy had largely dissipated. Nonetheless, the status of radio diminished over time, becoming seen as secondary to television for decades. It remains, however, an important means of the dissemination of music, even after the advent and subsequent waning of MTV in the early 1980s and the rise of listening of popular music for use in film, television, and advertisements in the 1990s and after. In fact, terrestrial radio today is still the way that most people in the US hear most new music, whether mainstream or independent. Radio, a mass communications technology nearly 100 years in widespread usage, still matters. Extremely specific statistics are kept in the US about radio, radio airplay, with radio charts noting the exact number of spins of a recording uh, of a particular song receives every week. Here's what this looks like. I don't know if you can see it, but there are numbers of spins. I can share this later. Or you can, you can just go to the website, um, America's Music Charts, which is the old website. It'll take you to the new website, uh, uh, which will have all these statistics. There's a paywall. This is the only free stuff you can get, is what you can see on the screen. Um, the number of spins needs to be recorded so that musicians, if they are songwriters, can get paid, usually a small amount, except for hits, through their performing rights organizations, uh, such as American Society of Composers, Auth Authors, and Publishers, and Broadcast Music Incorporated. Radio airplay, as is well known, represents a kind of advertising for musicians' work and is not usually much of a source of income for them. But it is a measure of popularity, which can be easily translated into economic value, represented by sales of recordings or licenses for use in advertising, television, or film. Greg Katz, music industry worker by day, band member, and proprietor of a small indie label called New Professor, and radio DJ by night, says, quote, radio stations call out to their listeners and play them samples of songs to see if they dig it. So there's literally a market research aspect to whether a song becomes a hit. That's the end of the quote from Greg. If listeners say they don't like a song, it won't be played very often, he says. Radio still matters, even in small local scenes, such as the indie rock scene in Echo Park, which is a, a, a neighborhood in Los Angeles, a neighborhood in which Greg Katz is an important figure. In fact, radio in this scene is still critically important. Despite what one hears almost daily, it seems, about the dying or radically transforming record industry, from indie musicians, most of the traditional pathways for getting their music out to fans remains the same. Katz told me that as a label owner, he would like to do everything he can to help raise awareness of his label's bands, securing physical distribution in stores, urging his bands to tour more, ideally in a city where their recordings can be purchased in an independent record store, and trying to get more press. And he says, quote, I'd like to expand into doing more radio stuff because as a DJ, I know especially radio is the only unmediated way to encounter new music, so I want to hone in on that, unquote. Uh, and in, the, in this conversation, he's referring to college radio and public radio and community radio stations more than commercial radio stations. And Larry Little, a manager of indie bands in Los Angeles, told me how young bands espousing the indie do-it-yourself aesthetic need to understand that they still must rely on the traditional means of disseminating their music, including radio. Radio is a dying thing, he said, but is still very powerful. And every time I think it's not powerful, I have something happen that reminds me, like a show in Buffalo, New York, where 350 people show up unannounced on a Tuesday night, and you've never been to Buffalo before, and you're not getting 300 in San Francisco or the cool cities, sorry Buffalo, whether you like it or not. So that doing interviews, shaking some hands with radio guys here and there, it all plays into the fact that it drives more heads to our show, which is more money in your gas tank and more people buying your t-shirt. 
It's all interrelated, and we're not living in a time where you can be so cool and aloof and give nothing back and expect it all. Clearly, indie rock bands in and out of Echo Park still rely heavily on radio airplay to promote themselves. Nima Kazaruni of the band So Many Wizards spoke of a colleague who told all of her KXLU DJs, that's a radio station, told all of her KXLU DJs about the show, and every single one played his band single. He said he heard it four times in a row. KXLU, a college radio station at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, places its request line telephone number in, lar in a large font on its website, so it is easy for listeners to contact that station. Word of mouth still matters, especially when it is amplified by radio. Value is created in this scene, and not only in this scene, by being on the radio, which not only might help sales of recordings and attendance at shows, but adds to a band's reputation in the scene. And radio, as well as other forms of exchange, plays an important role in the social reproduction of this scene. All of this is pretty well known, of course. Perhaps less well known is that radio time can be purchased. Musician Michael Fiore of the band Criminal Hygiene, when talking about publicizing the band today in today's market, told me, if you have leisure time and you're just living off of whatever, you have all this time to scheme up tours and to talk to all these people. If you have money, you can make anything happen. You can pay for the best PR, public relations. It's easy, just give them $3,000 and they'll do it. Or you can pay for radio. If they like your song, or even if they don't like it, you pay a radio promoter, they can send your song to like three other radio stations for a fee and follow up for another fee. That's all the stuff that if you do get a label, the label will pay for. They'll start paying for your press and for your radio distribution. You'll owe them forever or probably never make a record sales back uh, uh, to pay them. Musicians or their representatives can pay for radio time to potentially create buzz, increase attendance at live shows and sales of recordings, not much different from the infamous payola practices of the past. For musicians, there's the obvious and continuing benefit of exposure, which is still so important that there are services that you can pay to ob obtain or increase it. Listeners can hear the music they like, be in the know, share their enthusiasm with friends, and more. And on it goes in a never-ending series of cycles of exchanges of time, money, and knowledge. Okay, so this next section is called circulation. Now, let me begin to lay out how we can theorize the circulation of music beyond this conception of flows. Some recent publications offer ethnographic studies of the global circulation of commodities, musical or not, studies that show in empirical detail just how things move and what people do with them. I've been especially inspired by anthropologist Purnima Mankekar's book, Unsettling India, from 2015. Purnima is my colleague at UCLA. Uh, this book offers deeply ethnographic interpretations of today's globalization and provides new, subtle and nuanced treatments of what a globalized present and recent past look like. Mankekar's insightful book offers a rich and sophisticated treatment of the movement or the unsettled stasis of peoples the circulation of commodities, media, and affect, and more, in contemporary diasporic public culture. Mankekar examines how goods and commodities travel and end up in Indian stores in the San Francisco Bay Area, and how media commodities move. Again and again, Mankekar takes up themes of circulation, emphasizing that the social world is never static. The idea that money and commodities circulate everywhere was, of course, central to Marx, whose discussions of circulation uh, is built on uh, the notion of countless exchanges. His comparison of barter to capitalist exchange is illustrative, a comparison that features a linen weaver who sells 20 yards of linen for two pounds, then spends the two pounds for a Bible. Writes Marx, the weaver has undoubtedly exchanged his linen for a Bible, his own commodity for someone else's. But this phenomenon is only true for him. The Bible pusher, 
who prefers a warming drink uh, to, uh, to cold sheets, having purchased brandy with his proceeds, had no intention of exchanging linen for his Bible. The weaver did not know uh, that wheat had been exchanged for his linen. It, B's commodity replaces that of A, but A and B do not mutually exchange their commodities. It may, in fact, happen that A and B buy from each other, but a particular relationship of this kind is by no means the necessary result of the general conditions of the circulation of commodities. Marx then makes a point about how the exchange of commodities takes on a life of its own apart from the participating individuals. There develops a whole network of social connections of natural origin entirely beyond the control of the human agents. Only because the farmer has sold his wheat is the weaver able to sell his linen. Only because the weaver has sold his linen is our rash and intemperate friend able to sell his Bible. And only because the latter has, already has the water of ever, everlasting life is the distiller able to sell his eau de vie. And so, on it, uh, and so it goes on. For Marx, capitalist circulation, since it involves money, entails its continuing movement. Goods move as well, but more fitfully. The process of circulation, writes Marx, unlike the direct exchange of products, does not disappear from view once the use values have changed places and changed hands. The money does not vanish when it finally drops out of the series of metamorphoses undergone by a commodity. It always leaves behind a precipitate at the point uh, in the arena of circulation vacated by the commodities. In the complete metamorphosis of the linen, for example, linen, money, Bible, the linen first falls out of circulation and money steps into its place. Then the Bible falls out of circulation and again, money takes its place. When one commodity replaces another, the money commodity always sticks to the hands of some third person. Circulation sweats money from every pore. Here, I am more concerned with the circulation of other commodities than money, but it is clear from Marx that it is money that makes possible the circulation of commodities. But if we understand value to be represented by tokens of value beyond money, that is, value can reside in things other than money, uh, music fandom, for example, represented in playlists and other shareable and movable tokens, Marx's conception is still useful. Things circulate on thoroughfares of commonly understood conceptions of value, whether or not these thoroughfares are made of money. Anthropologists Benjamin Lee and Edward Lapuma think that in today's globalized neoliberal capitalism, uh, uh, they, they think this capital, uh, capitalism is circulation-based, arguing that it is a new stage of capitalism in its history. I've also found the French sociologist and jurist Gabriel Tard, uh, who's undergoing a kind of uh, resurgence, uh, to be useful in understanding processes of circulation and exchange. Tard didn't possess a concept of culture, and which I do I'm, since I'm an anthropologist by marriage. Um, I sort of hang out with the anthropologists more than the sociologists. Um, so Tard didn't possess a concept of culture, which is perhaps surprisingly why his ideas are valuable in helping us to think through how, how ideas spread, and I would say gain a foothold or coalesce in particular cultures or social groups in particular places and times. What I'm saying is that it's, it's all too easy to say, oh, well, this music caught on because, you know, because of somebody's culture. It's like, well, that doesn't really explain anything. Todd's theories were predicated on the idea that social energy, ideas, affect, circulated from one person to the next like a contagion kind of like going viral, in, but in a 19th century manner, since he was working mainly in the 19th century. Representing Tard's ideas, however, requires a bit of introduction, since he, he does not subscribe to what is now social theoretical orthodoxy. Drawing on econ economist Charles Gide, who is the uncle of Andre Gide, to outline what he considers to be the four parts of political economy, Tard posits production, which he glosses as reproduction, circulation, distribution, and consumption. Circulation for Tard is only the, quote, imitative repetition of needs, labors, interests, and their reciprocal radiation by exchange, unquote. 
imitative repetition, or simply imitation, formed one of Tard's main theoretical foundations. Socially, he writes, everything is either invention or imitation. That is, everything is either new or not, and regardless, imitated or not. Ideas, desires, needs move from person to person, radiating out like ripples following a stone tossed into a pond. That was a favorite image of his. Society itself consists of, the, uh, of those imitating others or counter-imitating them, that is, doing the opposite of others. Todd believed that ideas or practices gained a foothold in the world, not for social or cultural reasons, but because of their transmission person to person. Opinion and its dissemination mattered. Long before Jürgen Habermas and Benedict Anderson and others, Tard considered the importance of the newspaper in spreading and solidifying public opinion, writing, if the individual members of a society separate to the point of no longer seeing each other or remain so separated beyond a certain short period of time, they cease to be associates. However, not all communication from mind to mind, from soul to soul, uh, are ne uh, necessarily based on physical proximity. This condition is fulfilled less and less often in our civilized societies when currents of opinion take shape. These currents of opinion can occur through disparate people reading the newspaper. The strange thing about it is that these men who are swept along in this way, who persuade each other, or rather who transmit to one another suggestions from above, these men do not come into contact, do not meet or hear each other. They are all sitting in their own homes, scattered over a vast territory, reading the same newspaper. What is then the bond between them? This bond lies in their simultaneous conviction or passion and in their awareness of sharing at the same time an idea or a wish with a great number of other men. It suffices for a man to know this, even without seeing these others, to be influenced by them en masse, and not just by the journalist, who is the common inspiration of them all, and is himself all the more fascinating for being invisible and unknown. Newspapers participate in creating currents of opinion by spreading ideas that are transmitted from one to another. Todd's aversion to what is now social theory or orthodoxy necessitated the development of an extensive theory of circulation, both word of mouth and through publications and what we would now call public culture. Marx observed that the sorts of endless circulations of money and commodities in the capitalist world, but Tard gives us a way of understanding how immaterial things such as ideas or radio music or digital, digitalized music circulate. This is writing you know, in the early 20th century. Thus far, I've mainly shown that circulation entails exchange. In this section, I want to argue that things circulate because they have value for people. The concept of circulation is predicated on conceptions of value. This position is clearly evident in Marx. Uh, here's a quote. The owner of a commodity is prepared to part with it only in re re return for other commodities whose use values satisfy his own need, unquote. Things produce exchange value in the form of money realized for a seller and use value for the buyer, though the latter can turn around and realize exchange value herself if she desires, and on and on. The first part of this argument to flesh out here is that things, including intangible things such as ideas or music, circulate and are exchanged because they have value for people. Koran Kaliskan and Michel Caillon make this point in linking circulation transformation and valuation. Nothing moves on its own, they write. Goods are produced because they possess value for those who produce them. Goods are distrib distributed because they have value for distributors. And goods are consumed because they have value for consumers. Things circulate because they are valued. On the question of value here, these authors, as well as Tard, are not that different from Marx. Things of value circulate whether or not they are considered to possess economic value. And here, Tard is useful again. He, re he recognized that there were other forms of value beyond the economic, believing that economists had focused too much on wealth as the only measure of value, when it was perfectly clear that conceptions of value existed in other domains, 
or what apoderai is usefully called regimes of value. And that in these other domains or regimes, value was quantified as well with the creation of hierarchies and other sorts of sorting criteria. And Tard continued to recognize the importance of conversation, writing, economists have given the name market to the geographical and social domain where the, where the system of market values is circumscribed uh, in solidarity with each other and where there's uniformity of price. What corresponds to the market made of moral, scientific, or artistic values? Wouldn't it be society in the narrow sense of the word? The world where conversation rolls on the same subject where one received instruction and the common education. Todd spends a good deal of time fleshing out this idea, even positing the need for a glory meter to measure the glory of people, which isn't that different today from uh, Bourdieu's conception of symbolic capital. For cultural goods, he writes, value outside of market value can be a complex matter. Todd says, the value of a book is an ambiguous expression because it, each of its copies, to the extent that it is tangible, appropriable, exchangeable, and consumable has a market value that expresses desirability, but in itself as essentially intelligible, inappropriable, unexchangeable, and un or inconsumable, which does not mean indestructible, it possesses a scientific value, which expresses its degree of credibility without counting its literary value, which signifies its degree of expressive, expressive seduction. All this may seem rather elusive, yet it has been axiomatic in the cultural industries for decades, if not centuries, that there is more value, th that more value than exchange value as expressed in price, as we know from the creation of canons of great works, the awarding of prizes, grants, and fellowships, and outside of the academy, the creation of the best of the year, lists, uh, prizes, awards, and much more. This sort of non-economic value of cultural goods just hasn't been theorized as much by those who study them. The second point I want to explicate here from Tard is that value is not simply conveyed through circulation, conversation, con communication, opinion, passed from person to person or more broadly through newspapers. Circulation creates value. Tard writes, as it grows within an individual, the desire for a thing becomes a special need for that thing. As it spreads in an outside group, this desire becomes the value of that thing. Through the knowledge that this thing is desired or capable of being desired by someone else, or through the judgment or on the capacity of this thing to satisfy a desire, there takes place a combination of a belief and desire, which quite as much as the communicability of the belief and the desire is essential to the idea of value. I'm arguing that value can be created in the same way for cultural goods as well, as they move through these circuits of conversation, opinion and communication, whether face-to-face -face or mechanically or digitally in public cultures. Rather like Todd, Benjamin Lee and Edward Lipuma, whom I referred to earlier, have also made room for other regimes of value in the forms of circulation evident today. Circulation, as they conceive it, possesses, quote, its own forms of abstraction, evaluation, and constraint, unquote, depending on the specific sorts of interaction of what circulates and by the communities around what circulates. It is these sorts of spe specificities that lead them to argue for their concept of what they call cultures of circulation which I would say is another way of conceptualizing regimes of value. I also want to echo Anna Tsing's extremely useful point that capitalism coexists with other modes of the production of value, sometimes translating them, that's her term, translating them into its own regime of value, sometimes not. Translation is the term she uses to label the processes by which values produced in varied non-capitalist modes of production are converted into capitalist inventory. In the case of cultural goods, uh, sorry, in the case of cultural goods, performed music is converted into an inventory in the form of recordings. Paying attention to every step in the capitalist supply chain, every act of translation, can help us understand how today's globalized capitalism works. To put it simply, 
While the concept of re regimes of value is a useful way to understand consumption of goods and the values they can acquire, we need Singh's insights to understand that there are not just different regimes of value, but different regimes of the production of value. In attempting to move from flows to circulation, I'm arguing that we must also consider value. And if things thought to possess value are circulating, then we must consider exchange, both of tangible and intangible things. As I theorize it here, exchange continually constitutes and reinforces social groups, even those composed of individuals who might not know each other, as in newspaper readers or capitalist markets. In this section, I will discuss how circulation and exchange contribute to social reproduction. Don't worry, we'll get back to radio. Anthropologist Jane Fagens critiques theories of exchange, especially uh, from uh, Marcel Mauss and Claude Lévi-Strauss, for focusing too closely on acts of exchange and rep reciprocity, and not understanding the broader role, role played by exchange in social production and reproduction. Her conception of production includes not just the production of products, but their values, which are realized once the product is integrated into the wider society. It is through circulation, Fagin's writes, that social values are realized. Here's a quote from her. Exchange is the point at which the latent value created in production uh, processes, uh, sorry, created in production processes and embedded in the products is transformed into publicly recognized forms of value, unquote. I've argued elsewhere, drawing on Clifford Gertz, that the search for value is another way of understanding Gertz's insistence on the centrality of meaning in the lives of the social actors we study. Fagens argues, argues similarly that exchange is normally the context in which the search for meaning is uh, consummated. For her, therefore, exchange is a crucial aspect of, the, of social, uh, social production and reproduction. Indeed, according to some anthropologists, it is exchange that continually constitutes and reconstitutes society. Annette Weiner, another anthropologist, posits exchange in terms of what she theorizes as reproduction. Any society, she says, must reproduce and regenerate certain elements of value in order for the society to continue. Weiner focuses her argument on Melanesian systems in which reproduction and regeneration are culturally articulated and elaborated. For her, Exchange interaction is reflexive, uh, reflective of the kinds of symbolic and material values a society accords its productive and regenerative flow, she says. This flow must be fed or the system or part of it begins to collapse. The modus operandi of this feeding, she says, is exchange. The years long circulation of objects reproduces, nurtures and regenerates social relations in Melanesia where she studies. While Wiener is mainly concerned with Melanesia, I think these insights are useful for understanding complex societies, which is what, in part, my efforts here are about. But back to Fagin's. She makes clear, as I am arguing here, that to understand circulation and exchange, we must be attentive to cultural and historical specificities. She argues that exchange is a, a common and important medium of circulation, but if we seek the source of exchange values in the act of exchange, we will be missing something. Exchange values, as all values and other social phenomena, she writes, are produced in concrete activities, which are then, through circulation and exchange, integrated into a society's system of social production. Most theorists of exchange confine themselves to a consideration of the exchange of physical goods, not those that are intangible. Fagens is rather inconsistent on this point, sometimes stating that exchange, and therefore the realization of value, can only occur in the exchange of objects. But she also says that it is possible that circulation occurs where there is no exchange, mentioning the exchange of knowledge. She discusses at some length the circulation and exchange of values, citing public displays as an example of circulation and exchange occurring, occurring simultaneously without the exchange of physical objects. Despite this example, Fagens generally assumes that there is no realization of value without exchange of objects, a point with which I disagree. I view circulation 
being constituted by exchanges without a physical object necessarily being exchanged. In the case of co musical concerts or going to a museum, there's the cost of the ticket that can represent exchange, money, exchange for time, or rather action. One must decide to go to the show or a museum. And so what is being exchanged in that action is one's time and attention for whatever one hopes to realize from viewing uh, the painting or seeing the play, hearing the concert. In making this claim, I'm building on and extending, extending an argument I have made elsewhere in which I said that value is stored up through rehearsals and all the things that go into a public performance display of music. Musical performances are the moments during which uh, stored up value through rehearsals, individual practice, instrument manufacture and repair, costume design and manufacture and much more. All of these things are stored up and the value is potentially realized in a performance. It is perhaps because of this question of the exchange of intangible objects that Tard considered the production and circulation of the book and its value, as well as the production of knowledge and its exchange. But exchange, he says, is an economic concept that doesn't transfer to the sort of exchange represented by books. In fact, he says, giving and theft are moral notions foreign to political economy but exchange is a purely economic concept. It is through metaphor or misnomer that says of two interlocutors that they exchange their ideas and their admiration. Trade, in fact, of beacons and beauties does not mean sacrifices. It means mutual influence by reciprocating the gift, but a gift quite privileged, which has nothing in common with wealth. There, the giver divests himself by giving. In, in fact, as for truths as well as for beauties, he gives and retains both. Tard also argues, quote, unlike wealth, which can only be exchanged at the cost of someone's sacrifice, and which consequently requires some measure to regulate the extent of this sacrifice, the exchange of knowledge is an addition on both sides, not of subtraction, unquote. Except, he says, quote, when the knowledge is contradictory, but in this case, there is no exchange but a duel to the death, either in the enclosed field of an individual mind or in the battlefields of sects or parties or religions, uh, religious wars." Unquote. I would continue to argue here that the exchange of ideas and other in intangible things is a kind of exchange if we are thinking in terms of regimes of value. People on the giving side may, be, may believe themselves to be receiving something in return, and those on the receiving side also believe themselves to be receiving something beyond the ideas themselves. In short, exchange, as I'm employing the term here, thus encompasses production, circulation, and consumption of tangible or intangible things, all of which, of course, are shot through with conceptions of value. There is precedent for this in Marx's thinking. The term circulation might imply a kind of agentless process, or a process not much different than flows, in which agents' desire and intentions by which I mean the regimes of value into which they place goods, are not taken into consideration, just as consumption can too often be taken to, be, to refer simply to an act of purchase or the use value of the good. By exchange, I mean to refer to the myriad acts by which social actors acquire and dispose of cultural goods, tangible or intangible, because of the value they are perceived to possess or represent to those social actors. Exchange is more than just the exchange of money or the giving and receiving of a gift. Most recorded music that circulates, for example, was originally conceived as a commodity, but it exists in that regime of value and other regimes once it begins to move, according to innumerable social actors' acts. The exchanges for music that occur take the form of action required to download this rather than that, listen, create a playlist, share a playlist, and more, the sort of sharing uh, of ideas theorized by Tard. This is time exchange for the labor of those who made the music, recorded it, distributed it, advertised it, marketed it, and more. In some of what I was reading before, Tard is clearly gesturing toward what we would today call public culture, the realm of the circulation of Represent, representational and mediational forms in which goods 
increasingly circulate, emanating from outside a country or region's borders, but also available to diasporic subjects around the world. This constitutes one of the primary loci of analysis of Punima Mankekar's book that I mentioned earlier, and in a way distinguishes her approach uh, uh, to questions of circulation from that of Anat Singh's, who was concerned with circulation of a particular commodity, the Matsutake mushroom, gathered in the Oregon, but en ending up in Japan. Arjuna Paderai and Carol Breckenridge offered a plea to scholars to abandon traditional lenses of analysis such as popular, folk, and traditional in order to try to come to grips with the complex way that cosmopolitan cultural forms could circulate. Public culture is the term they proposed to attempt to understand the countless cultural forms in circulation today, cultural forms that act as media for cul of cultural significance and that can be used in the construction of group identities. Mankekar also drawing on Apaterai and Breckeridge uh, uh, the, and their conception of public culture, views the relatively conglomerated inter international media companies not as monopolistic, but as what she calls rhizomatic and nodal, constructed in specific times and places with particular institutions such as the state or particular media industry. And she is concerned not with how a new transactional public culture replaces something that has gone before, but how the newer representations, affects, and sens sensations interact with the older ones, and how each remediates the other in what I would call an endless series of exchanges. The circulation of cultural goods in globalized public cultures also facilitates people finding others like themselves, forming alliances, fashioning identities, as Apaterai and Breckeridge argue, and as Mankekar demonstrates ethnographically in her book. Jane Fagens made the same point with respect to exchange, writing that exchange is the way that social actors labor in production is given meaning socially, and that actors adopt this value as an aspect of their social identity. What is more, societies or groups or tribes can be formed through the movement of ideas and opinions as Tard himself recognized. This transformation of all the normal groups in public is expressed by a growing need for sociability, which necessitates regular communication associated with a continuous stream of information and joint excitations. It is therefore inevitable, and it is important to seek the consequence it has or will have, in all probability, on the intended and transformed groups in terms of their duration, their sol solidity, their strengths, their struggles, or their alliances. Such an argument predates many, layer theor many later theorizations of subcultures, tribes, little cultures, and more, which have become quite commonplace in theorizations in the present and recent past. Back to radio. Radio, perhaps surprisingly, remains the most important means of the dissemination of new music to most listeners in the US, as I said, and it is scarcely different in the rest of the world, where radio played and continues to play an important role in presenting music and performing all sorts of social and cultural work. Radio or any communications medium is predicated on the idea of exchange. People listen or watch or read or view because they believe they are receiving something of value, entertainment in the form of music or something else, uh, information, inspiration to become musicians, and more. And those who uh, produce believe themselves to be receiving something in return. People's attention either, either to uh, propaganda uh, or what is considered to be useful information and much more. If we are to think of radio as part of the countless exchanges that occur in a public culture, then it is useful to revisit the famous argument by the Canadian economist Dallas Smythe about the audience as commodity in broadcasting. Smythe's position is predicated on Marx's theory of commodity exchange, and indeed, Smythe uh, considered exchange at some length, arguing that communication as a form of exchange is the same as exchange of money. Though what he really means, I think, is that the exchange of money and communications are both social acts. Smythe's understanding of the audience commodity is straightforward because, he writes, audience power is produced, sold, purchased, and consumed 
it commands a price and is a commodity. Advertisers purchase the services of, of uh, audiences with predictable specifications, which will pay attention to predictable, in predictable numbers, and at particular times to particular me means of communication in particular marketed areas. This involves labor by consumers who effectively work unpaid while watching or hearing, and in exchange, receive program material and advertisements. Audiences thus labor to market things to themselves. This is all Smy's argument. Smy's argument is that Marx is thinking about the nature of production, that production it produces consumption, can be used to help us understand the processes of the advertising and branding of commodities under our more recent capitalism. For Smythe, the relationship of the listener or viewer to broadcasters and advertisers wasn't simply one of the received or proffered ideologies, creating false consciousness or narcotizing messages, but a relationship producing surplus value for capitalists in what I am characterizing as forms of exchange. Before proceeding further down this Smythian path, let me acknowledge that there have been plenty of critiques of his arguments the issue for some critics, uh, that some critics have raised, for example, concerns Marx's labor theory of value. Is the consumption of broadcasts actually labor if audience members aren't being paid? I don't think there's a need to try to force the audience as commodity argument into a rigid technical Marxoid straitjacket. I am more in agreement with Anand Singh's argument in various places that capitalism has always relied on, as it continues to do, uh, it relied on non-capitalist forms of the, of the production of value. Value can be produced in regimes that aren't capitalist or even economic. Against the critics of Smythe who find his arguments to be simplistic or reductionist, um, I would say that understanding his main point to be that broadcasting and reception and advertising during broad broadcast are forms of exchange of value or values. Um, uh, some of these are capitalist exchanges, and some perhaps especially in alternative media, such as college radio, are less commodity exchanges than other sorts of exchanges, of prestige, for example. That is, even in cases of mainstream mass market broadcasting, when one's case is the strongest, that the audience could be considered to be a commodity, we still need to pay attention to other forms of value production that might be taking place. You know, what do audiences think they're getting out of what they're listening to or viewing? and thus how these exchanges work. Non-economic regimes of value can coexist alongside economic regimes, and non-capitalist forms of value can be translated, to use Singh's term, into capitalist forms. A final point about radio is that it itself exists in re regimes of value like anything else. That is, certain individuals, certain social groups, can value one form of communication over another, with perhaps the best example being young people who prefer text messages to email. At least that's true in the States. I think my students, uh, especially the undergrads, email is for communicating with their professors and their parents, but with each other it's text messages or you know, SMS. Radio is easily accessible to young people at colleges, hence the, importance of, uh, the important role played by college radio in the US in disseminating indie rock and other sorts of music. And pirate radio is also easy and cheap to set up. There are many online guides about it. Two reasons why radio still matters for indie rock, uh, indie rock musicians. The point here is that certain media can be valued by certain social groups for circulating their music or whatever, and those media can themselves be placed in regimes of value of particular social groups. So this presentation has sketched out a way of thinking about circulation of cultural goods, tangible and intangible, that attempts to complicate and add nuance to the useful framework offer, offered by Arjuna Pottarai a couple of decades ago. Uh, though such concerns are part of a larger history of attempting to understand how things circulate. Although this case study is of an old technology that remains relevant, the perspectives I've presented should be useful in furthering our understanding of how music physical or digital moves through various means, whether broadcast digitally or physically. While much has been made about how the internet has changed everything, or what I've elsewhere called technological triumphalism, most people, use, uh, most people mostly use technologies to do what they have always done, 
including making music, listening to music, sharing music, sharing ideas about music, recommending artists, songs, genres, recordings, and much more. But with today's digital technology, such acts can occur faster and travel further. Regardless of speed or reach, all of the actions involved in making and listening to music and disseminating it uh, reveal and produce what particular social actors value. If something is valued, it will be exchanged, but if something ex is, is exchanged, it acquires value. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions, as I said. Yep. Uh, uh, I think we have time for the questions. I wanted to ask Mario. Let's do one at a time. Do you do it in English? Yes. Okay. Everything is fine. I'm going to try to translate. Our official translator, Pedro Marra. Ah, ah, ah. Our official translator, Pedro Marra. <risos> Oi, Tim. É, eu achei muito interessante é, a construção toda. Adorei as citações de Marx e também a, a relação da importância da rádio universitária. Acho que é um negócio bem importante mesmo. A gente vive algumas coisas no Brasil aqui quanto a isso agora. Mas eu, eu, queria, eu queria discutir, queria ouvir tu falar mais é, sobre mesmo a construção do pensamento ali, sobre a tua teoria, que eu achei interessante, porque me pareceu um pouco, é, até puxando aqui um, um pouco para a pra minha, minha pesquisa também, né, inevitavelmente, eu achei que uh, é interessante como a leitura que tu faz a partir do Marx e do Tardio ela direciona, vamos dizer assim, a importância do, do rádio e de outras mídias, de outros acontecimentos, como, por exemplo, a produção de uma cena cultural, né? me parece que faz uma relação com a própria característica do meio de comunicação digital, no sentido de que a internet ficou caracterizada né, como, uh, pela produção de nichos de interesse, né, bolhas algorítmicas e tal, ou mesmo playlists, Uh, que, que provocam um certo público, que acionam um certo público. Né? Da mesma forma, aqui parece que a própria rádio ela, ela, ela produz também um certo nicho de interesse, né? aciona um certo público com um certo regime de signos e assim por diante. Né? É como se a gente uh, começasse a ter uh, então, um, uma leitura uh, de uma mídia, vamos dizer, analógica, a partir dos acontecimentos uh, relacionados ao digital, né? Então, não sei, é, coloquei aqui mais uma ideia. Queria que tu comentasse e agradecer mesmo pela pela fala. Muito obrigado. Um, thank you for your compliments. Um, this, this was uh, a, a difficult paper to write because uh, there was a lot of theoretical steps I had to get through. And um, a lot of this stuff by Tard has been used by people who don't want to employ a, a, a concept of society or culture because, that, because Tard didn't. Uh, and to me, those concepts are still important. So I had to find a way to use TARD that would, uh, uh, that would still work with, with my ethnography and talking about the culture of this scene that I studied. Um, what I would say with respect to your question about circulation is that while radio is still important, like I said, it's not the only thing that matters anymore. Um, and in fact, Larry Little, I, I, uh, whom I mentioned in one of these slides, he told me that uh, the most important thing for his bands, since I interviewed him a few years ago, the most important thing for his bands now is to try to get on a, on a Spotify playlist. That, that is really what marks their su success. Uh, radio still matters, but getting on a Spotify playlist really matters. 
and trying to get your music used in a TV commercial or a television show. Um, so it used to be that radio was simply a way of getting your music out there and getting people to go to the record store and buy your record. Radio mattered more than anything else. Now it matters, but it's one, only one of many things that matter. And of course, like I think your question was saying, you can, you can turn in, uh, tune into uh, radio around the world through streaming. I mean, this morning I listened to news from Los Angeles you know, through the app on my, on my phone. Some of you may listen to uh, KCRW in Santa Monica, which is a famous uh, radio station for, for indie music. Um, so on the one hand, radio is still doing the old fashioned work that it used to do in a community uh, like I talked about with these in indie rock musicians in Echo Park, but uh, you can listen to you know that community's music much more easily than you could before. So there's uh, there's a, a number of ways that musicians can get their music out there that didn't exist. And one of the things that I'm really talking about with my students a lot and have been trying to write about is. Uh, that I think we haven't taken musicians seriously enough for being very smart about how to make money. Uh, because I think we're used to talking about musicians as people who are trying to get a, a record contract uh, and that's how they make money and if they don't make, they don't get a record contract and that's it. But in some of the other things I've written about the, these indie rock musicians in Echo Park, Los Angeles, is they're very smart about um, uh, using other kinds of economic systems to, to make a living, you know, so they'll, I'm sure they, some of the things are done in, here in Brazil, like the band decides to go on tour, so they just, you know, use a network that, that they have, so they say, oh, I'm coming to your city, can I crash on your couch tonight, and, and they'll do the same thing when musicians come to Los Angeles. So, you know, anthropologists talk about this as generalized reciprocity, or uh, a generalized exchange, like uh, Levi Strauss talked about. Uh, musicians are really good at using various kinds of patronage, um, in Echo Park, there are businesses who will employ musicians because they want to support the scene, and if the musician says, hey, I have to take three weeks off to go on tour, the business will, business will say, fine. Um, and I think, uh, you, may, you know, if we actually study ethnographically what the musicians are doing and figuring out how they're using radio or how they're using streaming services, how they're making a living, living beside, or in addition to how much they get paid or how little they get paid, I mean, these Echo Park indie musicians, when they're playing in LA, they might get 35 or $40 a show, so it's almost nothing. So they need, they need to figure out how to make money some other way. Um, and if we pay attention to how they do that, you know, how they use radio, how they use streaming, um, I think we'll have a much better understanding of that scene than, than we used to have. And we'll get beyond uh, the conception of musicians as selling out or not. Um, uh, and that's part of what my work on these indie rock musicians has been about. Um, so, sorry, that's a long-winded answer, uh, uh, but, I, but I hope I addressed your question. Bem, é, então, ele estava dizendo que, por um lado, que começou falando da, da importância que ele vê no, no tarde de ser acessado uma, e nessas ideias que hoje são um pouco ortodoxas para a sociologia, né? É, mas que para ele ainda são muito importantes para entender a sociedade, as trocas e a circulação. Né? E isso tem a ver um pouco com também essa articulação dos meios que ele estava falando aqui, né? que hoje tão, é, ainda é muito importante estar tá circulando no rádio, mas também é importante estar tá circulando nessas outras, outras plataformas. E, às vezes, inclusive, é mais difícil você entrar numa playlist do Spotify do que você conseguir tocar sua música no rádio local. E, por outro lado, também, e isso é uma coisa, inclusive, que me interessa muito, eu, quer dizer, eu dou aula de rádio, mas e falo isso muito com os alunos que acham, meus alunos têm 19, 18, 17 anos, eles não escutam rádio, eles acham que o rádio morreu, né? mas o rádio é um dos, dos meios que mais lucrou com a convergência de mídias. Né? Então, por streaming, ele mesmo estava contando aqui que hoje ele escutou o noticiário de Los Angeles, pela internet via streaming, né? Mas o que é importante disso são as formas de circulação como geradoras de, de um valor, né? 
que, por um lado, é um, uma espécie de um capital simbólico, mas que ele pode ser convertido em, em valor econômico. Né? Quando você pensa que uma banda lá do, do, da, da cena onde ele... do Echo Park, né? lá, lá de Los Angeles, onde ele estudou, vai ganhar aí 30, 40 dólares por show, o que é muito pouco, mas isso é uma oportunidade para estar tá aí vendendo outros produtos ou estar tá circulando de outras formas, acionando as redes que, que essas bandas já têm. Né? Essa ideia de que a banda precisa de assinar com uma gra grande gravadora para conseguir é, um contrato que vai garantir aí uma, uma, um valor pré-estabelecido, né? e isso está um pouco cada vez mais caindo em desuso. Né, mas é, tem essa questão mesmo da própria circulação com, e, e da convergência mesmo, no caso, das mídias como forma de agregar valor. Né? Acho que foi isso, né? Uh, Tim, I, I, will, I will ask you to, just to, to pay attention, a little bit of attention in me, because sometimes I'll need to, for you to like, stop so I can translate a, a thread and then we can go on. Okay, sorry. Oi, Tim, aqui. Marcelo, sou o Marcelo, tudo bom, pessoal? É, eu queria agradecer a palestra. É, tem uma coisa curiosa que a gente está numa universidade que teve só a rádio fechada recentemente, e é o Unicinos.fm, e é uma rádio que, historicamente, por 20 anos, ela focou no rock, e foi muito importante para ser independente daqui de Porto Alegre, que... A, Devido às proporções, a gente pode comparar com o Echo Park, que é a, o, o bairro ali de Los Angeles, né? onde o, o, a cena que tu estudou. E as, as bandas locais, inclusive a minha, a banda do Mário aqui do lado, tocavam na rádio. E a gente tem sentido assim, um buraco na, na, na cena. Né? Mário, não sei se tu pensa assim também. E eu não sei, eu gostaria de te ouvir falar um pouco Sim. sobre algo, algo que tangenciou o debate da, da tua fala, que eu vejo, para mim, eu via muito, muito a grande importância da, da rádio da Unicinos aqui era a curadoria musical que era feita pelos radialistas, que é uma coisa que a gente não tem na internet, é, que não é a mesma coisa, né? Tu pode escutar um podcast, tu pode é, ver uma, uma lista feita no BuzzFeed, ou seja lá o que for, não é a mesma coisa que ter um radialista ao vivo Uh, falando sobre as bandas novas e trazendo as pessoas para serem entrevistadas aqui, né? Uh, então isso também me parece ser uma forma de troca aí, né? Que tu apresenta o teu trabalho. Então não sei se tu pode falar um pouco sobre essa questão da curadoria, né? Desses, uh, dessas pessoas especializadas. Fico pensando também na né, XP, por exemplo, né? Que tem um canal no YouTube e que é muito importante para a divulgação das bandas, né? Obrigado. Uh, uh, thank you, Marcelo. Yeah, this is a very important uh, point. The, the curat curatorial work played not just by radio stations, I think especially by radio stations, but um, uh, in the Echo Park scene, there was, it's gone, but there was a, a record store that, that uh, specialized in vinyl recordings. And any band that had a recording come out, they could, they could do an album launch there in the record store and uh, Uh, and they wouldn't have to pay, and people could come and, and hear the music. So there, there was this really imp important infrastructure of you know small radio stations and or college radio stations, and these shops you know in real places, not online, that yeah. can help uh, curate the music and get it out there, not just for the community, which is important, but beyond the community at the same time. Okay, então é ele está falando que o papel de curatorial das rádios realmente é muito importante, mas às vezes a gente esquece de outras coisas que é, é, per, a gente perde de vista, né? Por exemplo, o próprio papel que lojas de discos podem ter no, nessa curadoria, né? Ele está falando que um dos, além das, das rádios locais, né? Lá para o Echo Park, né? Também tinha uma, um importante papel pra, nesse papel curatorial, uma loja de discos no bairro que disponibilizava os discos dos artigos do, do, dos artistas locais, opa, o disco dos artistas locais não só para venda, mas também para as pessoas escutarem de graça, né, e lá e escutarem, né? Então você tem aí um papel é, de seleção 
que acontece nos ambientes locais mesmo. Né? É isso. Tell me more about your scene uh, later. Oi, Adriana. Uh, queria parabenizar o Tim né, por essa fala. Acho que ela é muito relevante nesse momento que a gente está vivendo no Brasil. né? Uh, enfim, uh, eu queria que tu falasse um pouco mais né, sobre essa questão da, do, do termo do Apaduraí, né, enfim, da ideia da cultura pública né, em vez da cultura tradicional, e pensar uh, uma coisa que a gente discutiu muito no projeto que a gente tinha aqui, né, o Pop Music Scenes, essa questão da memória e do arquivo, né, como é que a gente pode pensar essas, a relação circulação e memória também dentro dessa da ideia de cultura pública. So the public culture idea was started by uh, Arjuna Padurai, uh, uh, who was trained as an anthropologist, and his wife Carol Breckenridge, who was a historian, and she worked in India. So uh, it really grew out of uh, their interest in Indian culture and the movement of, of South Asian people around the world and how their culture went with them. And the older categories of like folk or popular traditional didn't really capture um, The, the movement of, of you know Indian films or whatever that they were interested in. And so they theorized this notion of public culture and they started a journal in the same year, 1988, uh, called Public Culture, which is still going. And it's a very, obviously, since I employed, it's a very useful concept because, uh, uh, you know, not only does it get beyond those categories of, uh, like a folk, it gives us a way to try to grab onto how things move um, around the world and move very quickly and maybe I'll stop there uh, for Pedro. <laughs> ok. Uh, então ele está falando que a, essa categoria de cultura pública, essa, esse conceito de categoria pública foi cunhado lá pela Padurai, que é um é, sociólogo, cientista social indiano, né? e que de alguma forma essa categoria foi criada para um pouco passar ou superar limitações que coisas como folk ou o tradicional né, é, colocam para a gente, porque mais do que congelar esses, esses tipos de produção cultural, a categoria de, de cultura pública está mais, tá mais interessada em entender como que isso circula mas, mas em nível inclusive global, né, de como que de repente a gente acaba aqui escutando música tradicional indiana, né, ou sei lá, né, é, qualquer outro tipo de coisa assim, né. Então, enquanto essas categorias do tipo tradicional, popular, folclórico, elas congelam e pre é, prendem, territorializam, né, e, e, e ancoram em um lugar específico, cultura pública permite pensar a circulação né, dessas músicas entre lugares. And what I would say about archives and memory, that, that was a, uh, actually addressed in Punima Mankekar's book that I referenced. She was very interested in questions of the archive. Um, you know, what happens when, if you're a, a diasporic Indian person, uh, the, the term we use in the, in the States and maybe in Brazil too is NRI, non-resident Indian. Um, but Uh, a lot of these NRIs, you know, have extensive, like, physical archives or memories of, you know, life back in India. I mean, Purn I, I had the pleasure of knowing Purnima's mother, who liked listening to old recordings of Indian popular music and watching old films. Um, that's not something I've studied so much. Um, partly, I think, because, at least in the Echo Park scene, everybody was so young, they didn't have much of an archive or a memory. There was an older person who people talked about to me as a kind of, uh, you know, senior figure in the field, but I can never get to interview him. Um, I think a lot of these small scenes come and go, come and go very quickly, like scenes tend tend to do, uh, which is unfortunate. And once in a while, there's somebody who might hang on to you know, uh, archival materials, but often they don't. I think uh, it may be that. Uh, digitally, we can hang on to some of this stuff in ways that we couldn't before, but websites will get taken down too. Um, I, I can't give you a better answer than that because I 
you know, I, I didn't ethnographically find questions about archives and memories with this particular project, but you're right to bring it up. É, então, ele disse que a autora é, indiana que ele citou aqui também, Makeka, right? Her name, what's her name? Makeba? Oh, Man Mankeka, yeah. Ela tem, a Mankeka tem uma parte she's, que ela trabalha com... É, em que ela trabalha também com, com, essa, com essa questão do, do, do arquivo e da memória, na, na, na discussão dela de circulação, mas que ele especi especificamente na pesquisa que ele fez no Echo Park isso era uma isso não aparecia porque na verdade eram pessoas era a cena é composta por pessoas muito jovens então o acúmulo de repertório desse, desse, desses arquivos e, e memória ele é pequeno também e ao mesmo tempo tem uma questão que é sempre problemática quando a gente pensa em, em cenas musicais urbanas é que é tudo muito efêmero e isso aparece e some muito rápido, né? E também feito por pessoas jovens. Então muitas vezes você tem mesmo um problema mesmo de pensar essa coisa da, da, da memória do arquivo. Às vezes fica em, isso fica em, em sites digitais, né? Mas mesmo aí a coisa se perde. Então, realmente, é uma questão pensar os arquivos. Uh, oi, Tim. Obrigada pela palestra. É, eu fiquei pensando em várias coisas assim é, relacionadas à circulação, inclusive com alguns autores que você citou, como a Nett Weiner. É, é que, assim, por exemplo, no caso das trocas, eu fico pensando muito porque várias pesquisas sempre glorificaram a internet como um dos principais meios de circulação da música atualmente. E, por exemplo, é, várias pesquisas falam, inclusive, que esse fator foi na década de 90, é, por exemplo, fora do Brasil. Mas, no Brasil, como a gente tinha um contexto de inflação e também de dificuldade de acesso a computadores na década de 90, até o início dos anos 2000, é, a gente não baixava tanta música assim, porque, inclusive, era internet de escada, principalmente é, nas cidades do interior, como uma, uma das que eu vim, que é a Barra do Piraí. Então, assim, essas trocas entre amigos e entre, entre conhecidos de sugestões de bandas, ou até mesmo no caso de se copiar a música através da, das fitas cassete, é, continuou sendo muito importante é, em coexistência com o rádio, a MTV na época também, é, e nem tanto a internet, foi mais, popularizou assim, talvez a partir de 2003, 2004. Então eu queria saber, é, no contexto da sua pesquisa é, da música indie, se você chegou a ver essa questão da importância das relações sociais e das alianças no caráter das trocas e da música. Um, great question. Uh, I mean, one one of the things that interests me is uh, it's not the di not just the different ways that musicians can make money, and not just the different ways that uh, things can be exchanged, uh, but what what makes those exchanges? I think when we talk about exchange a lot, we we assume that it's kind of impersonal. The things go out there on the internet, but I think. One of the reasons that I got interested in this value literature was because it helped me try to understand better, or at least ask questions about, uh, instead of somebody just downloading a song or whatever, to try to think about, okay, but why are they downloading this song and what is it they value about it? And seeing it as not just somebody getting free music or not, not paying any money, but understanding that you know, something of value or an exchange of value was happening even if there's no money. Um, and that, uh, to, to address your point, I think you know, just as musicians can make money in more than one way at, you know, at the same time, uh, we're all participating in lots of different exchanges all the time, whether they're face-to-face -face or electronic or uh, through the mail or whatever. Um, and it's a really good question about face-to-face uh, -face exchanges uh, which I studied less uh, for this project, but it's 
but I can say that, um, oh wait, should I pause here and then this is a good place to stop and then I'll, okay. then I'll get specific. Uh, So, então ele está falando que é, sim, eu tenho essa, essa questão toda da, da, das formas de troca, né, como como importante, mas sobretudo pensar a questão do valor, né, porque quando a gente fala de troca parece que é, as coisas se perdem na fiscalidade, né, tipo você coloca ali, na, você, você entrega sua música na internet, alguém 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 é, baixa a sua música e tudo parece muito impessoal, mas você tem que pensar também assim, ok, baixou minha música na internet, escutou minha música no rádio, mas é, quem sugeriu para mim baixar aquela música? Né? Isso importa também. Né? Tem, tem, um, tem um caráter pessoal nas trocas que às vezes se perde quando a gente fala de trocas. Né? Então, uma das coisas que tem é também essa coisa do, do, da troca face a face, que não foi, ele não estudou muito no, no, no caso do Echo Park, mas que tem um outro trabalho que é, parece que é o que ele vai falar agora, que vai, vai focar mais nessa questão do, do face a face e das redes locais, né, digamos assim, de trocas. Um, ok, então agora eu vou responder uma pergunta mais específica sobre face to face exchanges na cena. There were plenty. I mean, people, I, I bet it's not much different here, but if you went to somebody's show, you could buy a cassette, and a lot of these bands were releasing cassettes, cassettes rather than CDs. Uh, so you could buy a cassette, buy a vinyl recording, get a T-shirt, and a lot of these bands would buy stuff from each other <laughs> um, uh, you know, to, to support each other, because a lot of them, they all knew each other. They would play at the same venues, and a lot of them lived in Echo Park. Uh, that's less true because it's expensive now. Um, And people would do things like, I mean, I remember one band member told me that uh, on, uh, on his band's Bandcamp page, if they, if they announced, hey, we're going on tour, then Greg Katz, whom I mentioned, Greg Katz would give, give them or donate $35 or $40 for gas in the van. Uh, that's not face to face, but it's another way that you know, exchange happened and it wasn't just about music. And 30, $35 or $40 is this magic number, like I said before. That was how much you get paid for a gig on average. So if somebody gives you $35 or $40 for gas in the van, that's a, a symbolically important number. Um, and people were doing this kind of thing with each other all the time. Uh, and these uh, cassettes were often very cheap, the, only $5, so you could uh, buy a cassette from your, from your favorite band and they could buy one for you. So uh, these weren't what I or even Marx would call, you know, capitalistic exchanges. It was more, uh, more like uh, a generalized reciprocity where people, you know, you're, you're constantly buying and re receiving stuff from all your other band members um, and constantly trying to go to people's shows too. So, um ele vê essa coisa da, da, das relações face a face muito nas trocas que podem ser econômicas, mas que também são face a face, né? Tipo, quando as pessoas compram é, camisetas, fitas cassetes, que geralmente são baratos, né? Tipo, 5 dólares, coisas assim. Mas tem também muito o que a gente pode chamar aqui, o que a gente costuma chamar aqui de brodagem, né? Que, que tipo, as bandas, as bandas que compram é, o material das bandas amigas, né? E mesmo empréstimos e incentivos, né? Tipo, ok, contou o caso de uma banda que anunciou no, na página do Bandcamp dela que ia fazer uma turnê, né? E aí uma outra banda amiga contribuiu com 35, 40 dólares para gasolina, para a van, para fazer a turnê, né? Então, é uma coisa em que o, o, quase que as, as cenas vão, 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 vão criando maneiras locais de se autossustentar. E, assim, quer dizer, parece pouco, 35, 40 dólares para gasolina, mas é o preço de, de, do cachê de, de, de um show. Né? Então, as trocas vão acontecendo entre as pessoas que compõem a cena também. Né? Sabe? Acho que é um pouco por aí. Uh, só antes de voltar, lembrando pessoal, tem uma lista de presença rodando, então é para o pessoal assinar, está aqui, e tem uma pergunta da, do streaming. Aqui. Oi, uh, Tim, over here. Uh, actually, this is a, a question from uh, uh, online, from the streaming. 
Então, em português, né? Vamos lá. A Thaís Aragão, né, nossa colega, é, manda uma pergunta lá de Fortaleza. É, mais uma questão de uma curiosidade. Vamos lá. É, abre aspas. Como programadora musical, aqui na Universitária FM, trabalho com música clássica e hip hop. O Tim conhece estudos etnográficos sobre rádio e circulação envolvendo esses tipos de música? De repente, se ele conhece ou não, ele pode elaborar um pouco, né? Um, I, I can't think of any studies. There probably are. I'm not a hip hop scholar, so there, uh, there may be. Um, there's a guy named Aaron Johnson who wrote a book about jazz on the radio. I, I, actually, I'm not sure if it's out yet. It was a dissertation. It will be a book if it's not out yet. Um, classical music on the radio. Classical music, is, at least in the US, has been studied ethnographically, but Classical music on the radio is disappearing in the U.S. Uh, we still have one station in uh, in L.A. I don't. Uh, well, mostly they're disappearing in the U.S. Uh, I can't think of a station that does it. Um, it's too bad. It ought to be studied uh, in the U.S. context. But uh, I, I I do think more generally uh, that radio should be much more studied um, because it's like I pointed out in the course of this paper, it's still important. I think there's been a kind of uh, uh, eclipsing of the importance of radio because of the assumption of the importance of television, and radio has become seen as less important. But uh, as uh, Jose was joking with me before uh, before we started, uh, we're going to do a, a record a podcast tomorrow. And he said that's, well, you know, it's just a form of radio, which it is. You know, it's ra radio on demand. Uh, and I listen to plenty of podcasts. Um, so it's still with us because I think, as we know from many studies of, of recording technologies, we know that uh, convenience and portability matter a lot, and radio is still extremely convenient. You know, you can't watch television while you're driving your car or walking around, but radio or a podcast you can still use. Um, I think that I'll stop. Okay. Uh, então ele não é exatamente um, um estudioso de hip hop, né? Mas é, talvez tenha alguma coisa ou outra, né? Sobre hip hop e rádio. Ele falou Aaron Jason, right? Aaron Johnson. Aaron Johnson, né? Como alguém que fala de hip hop e sobre música clássica. Não, é, é exatamente jazz on rádio, jazz on the radio, the Aaron, uh, yes. So it's jazz on the radio, uh, o, o Aaron, né? Já a música clássica, você tem muitos estudos etnográficos sobre música clássica, mas, por outro lado, música clássica nos Estados Unidos tem sumido do rádio. Né? Então é uma outra, uma outra questão aí que é diferente, né? Porque, porque a Thaís pergunta. Mas, de toda forma, ele reforça novamente a importância de se estudar o rádio porque o rádio ainda é um veículo muito importante para saber como a gente é, escuta música né? e tem acesso a músicas novas. Né? Acho que um pouco por aí. Frank. Um, Tim, obrigado pela, pela fala, achei muito interessante. Eu tenho uma, uma questão bem específica quanto ao uso que tu faz na tua pesquisa do, do trabalho da Ana Tsing. Um, mais especificamente, me interessa a questão como ela elabora no trabalho dela, uh, me parece bastante importante a questão de uma terceira natureza, né? a questão de, tipo, da possibilidade de vida Uh, numa, na, nas ruínas do, do capitalismo, né? Isso parece ser central ao trabalho dela. E hum, eu queria saber se nesse sentido, a, na tua pesquisa, hum, as condições, digamos, uh, porque no, no trabalho dela ela fala também um pouco sobre como isso gera condições de vida e condições de, de troca também numa situação de 
de precariedade, né, de precarização uh, grande, que eu acredito que a maioria dos músicos, uh, em diversos contextos, uh, estariam bem acostumados já, uh, mas ela fala num sentido mais específico do, do, uma, do, um, do momento de intensificação do neoliberalismo. Né? Então, eu queria saber se as questões de uh, precarização, sobretudo na questão da, das condições de produção, uh, se interessa a tua pesquisa, como, como essas condições de produção uh, precarizadas também geram formas de, de valor, né? formas de valor não, não, não financeiro, no caso. Né? E, simbólico, né? Nessa, se isso, no caso, interessa a tua pesquisa, se tem desdobramentos a, a respeito disso. Obrigado. Right. Uh, thank you. Well, I have to say, um, Anna Singh's work has been really important to my work. She's probably the most significant uh, theorist I've drawn on in the last few years, um, because she really helped me understand that. You know, these narratives about how capitalism is taking over the world or whatever. Uh, in, in some ways that's true, I suppose, but in other ways, uh, you know, she helps us figure out that there are things out there that capitalism hasn't touched. Um, and this is something that we, we're all sort of aware of, even if we don't necessarily think about it. I mean, um, I, I didn't understand uh, Jose's <laughs> introduction But uh, some of you may know that I, I play Irish traditional music in Irish bars. And a couple of the people I play with are trying to make a living at a Irish traditional music, which is pretty much impossible. So it's very easy to say, oh, you know, capitalism has turned music into a commodity. And it's like, well, I know people who are dying for their music to be turned into a commodity, but capitalism is not interested in them. Um, and so Singh's work has really helped me understand that uh, capitalism is not total. Uh, it's still, it's hegemonic, you know, it's the dominant economic system in the world, but it's not total. And the idea that uh, we can find pockets out there where value is getting produced that might not be economic or capitalistic value or whatever, um, which capitalism could come in and turn into capitalist value, but the idea that there are these other forms of value out there, um, that to me is a very powerful idea. But então, é, ele está falando que a, o trabalho da Singh é muito importante para o trabalho dele mesmo, sobretudo nessa questão de entender que, para Anne Singh, é, embora o capitalismo seja hegemônico, ele não é total, então existem locais em que outras formas de valor são produzidas. Né? Ele dá o exemplo, por exemplo, de, de é, que ele é um músico de música tradicional irlandesa e ele costumou tocar em alguns lugares música tradicional irlandesa e se você for pensar é, formas de sobreviver desse trabalho como como músico de música tradicional irlandesa em bares isso seria na verdade impossível de tirar um sustento disso mas não é porque não se consegue tirar um sustento disso que não se produza um valor em torno da música tradicional irlandesa então, existem essas outras formas de, 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 de valor que escapam ao valor capitalista e que podem até depois o capitalismo chegar e se apropriar dessa forma de valor como forma de, 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 de gerar lucro. Mas, para além disso, você tem outras formas de valor que também importam, e a Anne Singh é importante para a gente pensar nessas outras formas de valor também. Uh, and I, with respect to the part of the question about uh, precariatization, I mean, that's also true, of course. Um, we, we certainly see it in American academia, uh, where more and more uh, faculty members are adjuncts, that is, they're not full-time, they're paid by the course. Um, uh, and that's very scary. It was almost surreal. I was on a review team of a, a university in Hong Kong And like in reviews, you, you meet different cohorts. So we met like the regular faculty and we met staff people in these different groups. And the adjunct faculty said, well, we're being phased out because we don't produce research. And in America, it's the opposite. There's more and more fa adjunct faculty uh, getting hired because they're cheaper if you're paying them by the course. So precarization is real. But I think, again, I, I would want to see it the way Tsing sees it, which is that it's not, you know, it's not some Uh, juggernaut that's affecting absolutely everything and there's going to be these places like Singh talks about where you know other forms of production of value can pop up I think with respect 
to the Echo Park scene, it was striking to me how every musician said, I just want to be able to make a living at music. Nobody said, I want to be a rock star, I want to make a million dollars. Nobody said that. They just want to be able to make a living at music. And that was pretty striking to me. Um, and the way that I talked about this scene in a different uh, publication is that uh, the, the mainstream, well, I think the way we used to think, or the way I used to think about such scenes is that it's kind of like the, the reserve army of the mainstream music industry. There's these indie rock people out there, and the mainstream music industry is going to, you know, once in a while reach in and pluck one of these people, and they're going to become famous and make a lot of money. Now I see it differently. I see it as a more uh, sort of uh, ma maintenance of a pre precariatized workforce in which musicians make almost no money, like I keep saying, they make 35 or $40 a gig. Um, uh, and because they make so little money, the scene can't, the scene can't really last. Um, so it's less a reserve army than uh, something that, uh, uh, to use the phrase that I got from a French anthropologist that I used to talk about this scene, the scene is both maintained and destroyed by capitalism itself. Uh, destroyed because you can't exist making 35 to $40 per gig. You have to do something else. And in effect, that ends up destroying the scene, even though uh, it destroys the scene's ability to reproduce itself, but it's still there for capitalism. You know, it's being maintained by capitalism if it decides it wants this reserve army. I don't like talking about capitalism as an agent, but it's, it's hard not to. So. Okay. Uh, então... É, a, o trabalho de, a Dani Singh aponta sim para essa questão da precariedade e ela é importante, ela está aí presente né, o tempo inteiro mesmo na, na, na produção dessas cenas né? e o que ele percebeu no, no trabalho etnográfico é que a grande maioria do, dos, dos músicos estavam dizendo o seguinte olha, eu não quero ser um rockstar, eu não quero ganhar rios de dinheiro, eu só quero conseguir sobreviver da minha música né? tipo, é igual a gente fala aqui, né, sobreviver da minha arte fazendo miçanga, né, <risos> e tudo mais, né? mas, enfim, né, e que, é, por outro lado, tem essa coisa do capitalismo que produz e destrói essas cenas, né, porque, por um lado, ele cria as condições e, de vez em quando, pinça um ou outro artista dentro de uma cena local e alça ele ao estrelato e, de repente, esse cara ganha muito dinheiro, mas isso é exceção da exceção. Então, ao mesmo tempo que o capitalismo cria, precisa de, de, dessa, da criação das cenas locais como forma de é, alçar e pensar essa, essas, esses, esses artistas blockbuster, digamos assim, né? é, ele também destrói, porque é impossível você sobreviver da sua música ganhando 30, 40 dólares, 35, 40 dólares por show. Então, a, a, o que acontece é que os músicos, a, as cenas acabam se, se autodestruindo porque elas, são, elas não são sustentáveis né, economicamente. Mas elas, ao mesmo tempo, elas vão surgindo, pipocando, aparecem, desaparecem, aparecem, desaparecem e vão, e vão se, vão, vão se é, sucedendo e criando valor de uma outra ordem. Né? Mas, definitivamente, essa questão da precarização é quase como se você criasse né, um lumpen proletariado de músicos, digamos assim, né, um exército de reserva, de, de mão de obra musical, né, que está ali mantendo também esse, essas condições precárias, né, de alguma forma. Né. E aí o que acontece é que as pessoas acabam desistindo né, do sonho de viver de arte, fazer nossa própria miçanga, né, ou enfim e vão fazer outras coisas. E, nesse sentido, então, que o capitalismo, ao mesmo tempo que incentiva, ele destrói essas cenas. E acha e a questão da precariedade, é pra, 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 né, em si, né, no caso do, 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 da pesquisa dele, passa por aí. Eu também queria, eu queria agradecer também a palestra do, do Tim e, e saudar, fazer um super elogio à organização é, o, não vou nominar todo mundo, mas, enfim, sei da, do envolvimento do Marcelo Contra, da professora Adriana, o Cult Pop, enfim. 
Então, me sinto super privilegiado, honrado de estar podendo usufruir desse momento. Uh, encontrando aqui também vários alunos do PPG Com e tudo mais. Vou tentar fazer uma fala rápida, organizada, por mais que eu nem sempre consiga fazer isso. né? Enfim. E minha fala não é só como gestor também de curso de música, mas como uh, músico, compositor, pai de músicos jovens, enfim. E tem uma famosa frase do Oscar Wilde, né? que é quando era jovem, eu tinha a impressão que tudo girava em torno do dinheiro. Quando adulto, eu acabei tendo certeza disso. Enfim, então eu, a gente está avançando um monte na, na discussão, entendendo essas múltiplas possibilidades de circulação, troca. Eu comungo muito com tudo que ele comentou e a minha, minha atuação o tempo inteiro, anos no meio musical, ela sempre teve, ela teve um diálogo, sempre veio sempre funcionou muito dessa forma também, né? enxergando a importância de dar o palco, dar o lado para quem está chegando. né? Uh, eu vou falar nessa questão do maldito dinheiro, que é muito uma leitura de um amigo, então, que a gente teve, digamos, 20, 20 e poucos anos de uma internet aparentemente gratuita, e, e teoricamente, hoje por mais que ainda existam trocas, exista, existe a possibilidade colaborativa, hum, secou essa fonte né, da, dessa mera questão da gente fazer as trocas né, de um ponto de vista de, de cultura participativa, inteligência coletiva, enfim. E que o maldito capital está voltando a falar como nunca. Né? As três grandes gravadoras detêm inúmeros selos né, a Sony, a Universal e a Warner, né, independentemente de mil selos que existem no mundo e iniciativas. Então, esse meu amigo teria essa teoria, que secou essa fonte no sentido de se tu vai querer, tu vai ter que assinar o Spotify, o Netflix, um serviço, diferentes serviços de, de streaming, né, e vários artistas que chegam a nós é porque a gravadora está bancando um card, um post, né, em que medida isso, em que, qual é a leitura dele sobre essa questão, independentemente de eu também entender e seguir atuando, acreditando muito nessa possibilidade né, de, de cultura participativa, colaborativa, se ele acha que essa leitura né, da hegemonia dos conglomerados ela segue muito forte, né, corroborando isso, que é uma teoria de um amigo. assim. Acho que eu consegui ser claro mesmo com minha natural enrolação. Um, well, great question. All great questions. I'm very happy. Um, I mean, it's hard to talk about the internet without being very ambivalent, ambivalent, because on the one hand, you know, it does allow people to come together and share interests across great spaces that didn't necessarily, you know, that wasn't necessarily possible in the past. Uh, on the other hand, you know. Uh, The internet and social media can get used to change election results or whatever, which is a big topic in the United States right now. Um, so there, you know, there is that side of it. I think it's been beneficial for musicians in some respects and not beneficial in other respects. And I think I would also say that this will allow me to uh, clarify what I meant when I talked about capitalism not being an agent, because it's it's easier to talk about capitalism as an agent. It's just you know. It's just simpler rather than qualifying uh, everything you say about capitalism. But the fact is that capitalism has agents. There are real people you know, sitting in record labels or somewhere who are trying to figure out how can I make money off of this. Uh, and sometimes they, they do and sometimes they don't. Uh, but once, if somebody thinks, oh, I'm going to try to make money off of this, but then they have to go to the, you know, the business side of the people in the industry and try to convince them. And sometimes they're successful and sometimes they don't. But there are always capitalists out there who are trying to figure this out. Uh, sometimes they succeed and sometimes, sometimes they don't. And that, that force or that desire to try to turn something into a commod commodity that's profitable for a record label, that's not going to go away. But you know, on the other side, there are musicians who can find each other um, or fans who can find musicians. Uh, all of which is a good thing, 
uh, record labels in the States now are paying a lot of attention to not just YouTube hits on particular bands, but they're looking at uh, how many of those hits are by return visitors. Because, you know, a video could get, a music video could get a, a million visitors, but if it's a million separate people, that's less valuable to a record label than, uh, you know, 50,000 people going there a hundred times. Um, so then they know they have dedicated fans and those are the, those are the fans who are going to be willing to spend recordings or go to shows. Um, so the way that a musician's popularity, which may seem to be sort of organic, um, that is getting, you know, uh, harvested or that data is getting harvested by capitalists in all kinds of ways. But I do think it's important to remember that, you know, capitalism has its agents who are real people and who are trying to figure out all the time, how can I make money off of this? Um, uh, but at the same time, there are real musicians who have real fans, who, who have real love and appreciation for their music, and you know, that's important too. And that's, an, that's another kind of value, but it sometimes clashes with the kind that the capitalists are seeking and tr trying to uh, uh, make money from. É, então, primeiro ele agradeceu todas as perguntas, achou todas as perguntas muito boas. Né? E com relação a essa pergunta do Frank, tem é, sempre é, sempre que a gente fala da, da internet, tem essa ambivalência entre a internet como produtora de encontros e, e, e colaboração e, por outro lado, a internet como fonte de é, circulação de capital. Né? Então, é, a questão é que ele não gosta muito de, fa de, 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 de falar do capitalismo como um agente, né? Mas a gente não pode esquecer, isso ele já falou, já tinha falado no anterior, né, na pergunta lá sobre a End Sing, eu não traduzi essa parte, mas enfim, né, tem essa coisa de que ele não gosta de falar como, do capitalismo como um agente, mas a gente também não pode deixar de ter é, em vista que o capitalismo é composto por agentes. Então, ao mesmo tempo que é, você tem os músico, músicos com fãs de verdade e a internet produzindo essa proximidade entre músicos e fãs reais, você tem também. É, pessoas né, olhando para isso tudo e procurando formas de é, extrair lucro dessas relações e extrair, inclusive, assim, a, a se apropriar dessas relações com vistas a lucro, eu diria até, aí eu sou eu dizendo, né, seria uma expropriação né, também de, 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 dessas trocas. Né? Então, isso é interessante, né? porque ele está tá dizendo aqui que as gravadoras hoje, por exemplo, quando olham para os hits do YouTube, né? Elas estão olhando para isso de uma maneira diferente, porque é, não importa só o número de views, mas também, às vezes, é mais importante você ter o. É mais importante você ter é, os usuários que voltam a um hit de YouTube. Né? Ou, digamos, um vídeo do YouTube que tem um milhão de views, de, de, de views e esses um milhão é visualizadores únicos, ele tem menos valor do que um vídeo que tem, um, que tem 500 mil views, mas que são 200... Que cada, cada, cada pessoa que visualizou o vídeo visualizou 200, mil ve 200 vezes. Né? Ou seja, não são visualizadores únicos. Esse vídeo tem é, maior valor porque a pessoa está ali voltando o tempo inteiro. Né? Então, as, o, o, a indústria fonográfica está olhando para isso também. Então, o que a gente percebe é que, sim, tem um lado essa coisa do valor econômico, financeiro, mas também tem a produção de outros tipos de valor, né? que diz respeito a isso, né? assim, da, da, das relações que são efetivamente reais e sólidas entre músicos e fãs, que fazem eu escutar um disco da Grafo Regis La Harmônica há 10 anos e voltar a escutar, e provavelmente vou chegar à minha casa e vou colocar de novo o disco da Grafo Regis La Harmônica, tem um tempão que eu não, que eu não escuto. Né? Acho que é, é um pouco essa questão aí também do valor. É, pessoal, eu vou fazer alguns avisos. Uh, primeiro aviso a gente vai ter um intervalo e, às quatro e meia, a gente volta para as mesas, onde a gente vai ter a apresentação dos trabalhos do Marcelo, da Dulce, do Felipe e da Melina. Tá? E, logo após essa mesa, a gente vai ter uma pequena apresentação no estúdio, ali atrás, da Camila e do Marcelo. Inclusive, a gente vai juntar 35 ou 40 dólares para eles. 
vai ser 35 ou 40 reais. É, e agora um avisozinho também, mais chatinho, é, os certificados eles só serão emitidos para quem tiver participação de 75%. Tá? Então, assinem as listas de, de presença e venham na, nas mesas hoje e amanhã duas mesas, às duas e às 16h30. Então, é, a gente já está na hora. Eu gostaria muito de agradecer. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Tim, for your talk. Thank you very much for your participation. And, uh, gostaria de agradecer a todo mundo e a gente se vê daqui a pouquinho. Muito obrigado. Thank you.